Today, FDA approvals of a CAR T cell therapy in non Hodgkin lymphoma and an agent to treat delayed chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting, priority review designations in melanoma and breast cancer, a breakthrough therapy designation in melanoma, and impressive findings in a multiple myeloma trial. Welcome to Enclave News Network, I'm Gina Columbus. The FDA has approved the CD19 directed chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy, Axicaptogene cellulosal, known by the trade name Yescarta, as a treatment for adults with relapsed or refractory non Hodgkin lymphoma. AxiCell is the second CAR T cell therapy approved by the FDA, with the first approval arriving in late August for patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. The approval, which is based on complete remission rates in the Phase II ZUMA-1 trial, is specifically for those with large B-cell lymphoma following two prior therapies, including for those with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, primary mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma, high-grade B-cell lymphoma, and DLBCL transformed from follicular lymphoma. In the ZUMA-1 study, AxiCell demonstrated an objective response rate of 82% and a CR rate of 54%. After 8.7 months of follow-up, 39% of patients remained in CR. The median duration of response in those with a CR was not reached at the time of the assessment. Axisil's label for the medication lists the ORR as 72% and the CR rate as 51%. The manufacturer, Kite Pharma, which was recently acquired by Gilead, plans to market Axisil at a list price of $373,000. The FDA has approved intravenous relapidant for use in combination with other antiemetic agents to treat delayed chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting in adults. The IV approval was based on a bioequivalence trial that showed the comparability of the IV formulation with the previously approved oral formulation. Other than infusion site reactions with IV relapidant, the safety profile in the study was consistent to previous trial findings with the oral formulation. Delayed nausea and vomiting occurs between 25 and 120 hours after chemotherapy. The FDA previously approved oral relapidant for this indication in September 2015, a decision that was based on three phase three clinical trials. The FDA has granted a priority review to a supplemental biologics license application for nivolumab to treat patients with melanoma who are at high risk of disease recurrence following complete surgical resection. The decision is based on results from the Checkmate 238 trial, in which nivolumab significantly improved relapse-free survival versus standard ipilimumab in patients with resected stage 3b, c, and 4 melanoma. Previously, the FDA granted a breakthrough designation for nivolumab in this setting. In the study, results showed that at a minimum follow-up of 18 months, the 12-month RFS rate was 70.5% in the nivolumab group versus 60.8% in the ipilimumab group. Among the patients with PDL1 expression less than 5%, the 12-month RFS rate was 64.3% in the nivolumab group and 53.7% in the ipilimumab group. Among those with PDL1 expression at more than 5%, the 12-month RFS rate was 81.9% in the nivolumab arm and 73.8% in the ipilimumab arm. In breast cancer, the FDA has granted a priority review to a supplemental new drug application for Olaparib for the treatment of patients with germline BRCA-positive HER2-negative metastatic disease who have previously received chemotherapy in the neoadjuvant, adjuvant, or metastatic settings. The application is based on findings from the Phase three Olympiad trial, which show that the PARP inhibitor Olaparib reduced the risk of disease progression or death by 42% and improved progression-free survival by 2.8 months versus standard chemotherapy in previously treated patients with BRCA-positive HER2-negative disease. Additionally, the median progression-free survival was seven months in the Olaparib arm versus 4.2 months with standard chemotherapy. At 12 months, 25.9% of the patients in the elaborate group and 15% of the patients in the standard therapy group were free from progression or death. A Prescription Drug User Fee Act date for a final FDA decision is set for early next year. In melanoma, the FDA has awarded the adjuvant combination of dibrafenib and trametinib a breakthrough therapy designation for the treatment of patients with stage 3 melanoma with a BRAV V600 mutation following complete resection. If approved, the combination would be the first adjuvant treatment specifically aimed at this patient population. 
Novartis, the manufacturer of the regimen, submitted phase three results to the FDA from Combi AD, a double-blind placebo-controlled trial of patients with completely resected stage three melanoma with BRAV V600E or V600K mutations. Results showed that the combination therapy reduced the risk of disease recurrence or death by 53% versus placebo. The estimated three-year relapse-free survival rate was 58% for the combination versus 39% for placebo. Median RFS was not reached in the combination arm versus 16.6 months with placebo. Phase three results from the ARROW trial demonstrated that higher dose once weekly treatment with carfilzomib demonstrated superior efficacy for patients with relapse refractory multiple myeloma versus a lower dose twice weekly regimen. Progression free survival was 3.6 months longer for patients assigned to once weekly carfilzomib at 70 mg per square meter with dexamethasone compared with those assigned to a twice weekly 27 mg per square meter dose with dexamethasone. The most frequently reported treatment emergent adverse events in either treatment arm were anemia, diarrhea, fatigue, hypertension, insomnia, and pyrexia. This week, we sat down with Dr. Daniel George of Duke Cancer Institute to discuss the Checkmate 214 findings of anivolumab compared with ipilimumab in metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Checkmate 214 uh, was really based on the preliminary data of uh, the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab in patients previously treated with VEGF-targeted therapies and other therapies in renal cell carcinoma. And in a phase one study, that combination demonstrated some pretty significant toxicity, but also some pretty significant uh, responses, even in that heavily pretreated population. Uh, at the time that that study was designed for a frontline comparison to sinitinib, um, nivolumab as a single agent had been tested in that same refractory population and um, had been awaiting the results, which ultimately led to its approval, uh, demonstrating an overall survival benefit over ever alignments. And so using the combination really leapfrogs the single agent data and puts this into the frontline setting. The population chosen for 214 was interesting. It was all comers at first, but then the population was limited to intermediate and poor risk, which makes up the majority of the population and was really the primary endpoint for uh, the study. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the initial results that were reported earlier this year as a press release demonstrated a significant difference in the overall response rate in favor of um, uh, ipilimumab and nivolumab versus sinitinib. It was about 41% versus about 22%. Um, but, and that was statistically significant in one of the co-primary endpoints. Another co-primary endpoint was the progression-free survival. The uh, secondary uh, endpoints included evaluation of outcomes based on PDL1 status. And it's interesting because there was an enrichment for um, all of these uh, outcomes, response rate and um, uh, overall survival and, and progression-free survival in favor of ipilimumab nivolumab for the pdl one positive tumors. Um, what's interesting about that is, as we might expect, because pdl one positive tumors is a poor prognostic indicator, it tracks with the intermediate and poor risk patients. The favorable risk patients only had about a 15% incidence of um, positive pdl one status. So not surprisingly, even though these are favorable risk patients, we didn't see the same kinds of benefits in that subgroup of patients with nivolumab and pilumumab combination compared to uh, sinitinib. So it suggests that for practice applications of this data, we're going to probably focus first uh, our attention on treating the intermediate poor-risk patients with pilumumab and nivolumab, and perhaps for the good-risk patients, particularly the pdl one negative good-risk patients, either deferred therapy or a single-agent TKI therapy like sinitinib, still a very reasonable choice. That's all for today. Thank you for watching Enclave News Network. I'm Gina Columbus.